Hey, it's John McBride, RMUS. Uh, I'm here during Tech Week. This is our uh, fourth day of Tech Week uh, transmission, getting uh, information out there, showing cool stuff that people are doing, as well as companies making an impact in the industry. And, uh, you know, for, for the most part, we've been having a great week this week. I don't know, Kevin and I have, uh, have, have definitely uh, kind of shown everybody and, and, and had, a, had a pleasurable uh, conversation yesterday with our guests. I think it was really fun. So we have a special one today. And, and today, Bossa Dynamics is who we're talking to a little bit about the spot. And we've, we, we have certainly seen that these guys, Boston Dynamics in general, making a huge impact into the robotic side of things. And traditionally, you know, RMUS has been doing a lot of drone stuff. But since we've engaged into the more robotic side of things, uh, you know, terrestrial, in this case, quadrupod, uh, Spot himself, is, it, it, it's really been shown value in so many different things, you know. And as we, you know, there was a really cool video, I'd love to play it, of them dancing and doing all kinds of, you know, fun stuff. I mean, we definitely have some great engineers putting stuff together for this. So um, I don't want to uh, uh, put it off too far. We've got a great uh, presentation today, but I want to introduce my counterpart, my uh, troublemaker guy. Did we lose Kevin? Yes, he's having, he is being a troublemaker. Oh, he is being a troublemaker, Tim. Uh, Let's talk to Tim for a minute. Oh, we'll talk to Tim. I'll go ahead and introduce Tim, you know, just, just as far as, uh, you know, people go. Oh, maybe he's back. I, is he back? I, I think he's back. Oh, I, man, this is what makes this these kinds of shows really fun. Just just so that, you know, you'll see that Kevin has no hair. And and, and, and he makes me nervous. So, it, no, I still, have, I still have hair. But he makes me nervous. Sometimes I want to pull my hair out with Kevin. But that's okay. Kevin, we love you anyway. <laughs> Can you hear us? You good? I can I can hear you absolutely, but I can't okay. uh, I can't see you here. Anyways, uh, can you guys see me? <laughs> yeah, yep, we can see you. We're good. Okay, fabulous. I don't need to see you. Anyway, it's great to uh, it's great to be here uh, live from the Great White North again. Uh, Boston Dynamics is uh, certainly one of the more exciting product uh, lines we work with. It was uh, it was exciting. I, I I believe we were actually technically the first reseller of Boston Dynamics. Uh, period. So we're kind of a pioneer with them, which is really exciting, um, and uh, and I think Canada, Canada, Tim, you can you can confirm this, but I believe in per capita implementations, Canada is number one in the uh, in the entire universe. So we're pretty pretty excited about that, and um, and we'll continue to build on it. So I'm I'm really really excited uh, for uh, for the session today. So. Um, Without further ado, then, I think I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the legendary and uh, magnificent uh, Tim Dykstra from Boston Dynamics. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kevin. I'm um, not sure what the population of, of the Great North is. So I, I don't know the per capita uh, stat off the top of my head, but RMUS is, is certainly uh, – getting robots out into the field north of the border. So that's that's really exciting to see. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what happens when RMUS sells those robots and, and how these customers are becoming successful, um, the steps that they're taking to, to be successful uh, in their implementation and in their deployment of SPOT. So we really want to walk through, you know, Oftentimes after people or as we're talking to people about buying a spot robot, the first thing they say is, how do we get started with, with this type of, of automation? And, and that's really what this, uh, this webinar is, is meant to do. So excited to, to talk through it with you guys. Well, I, I'm excited so as well. So we've... Yeah. Uh, didn't mean to interject. I was just saying that it, that uh, there seemed to be a bit of a pause there, but I'm excited as well. Kevin's smiling at me on that other side, but you know, usually in Tech Week, and I, again, don't want to don't want to pull too much. We usually have equipment back here, but I did I did want to say before you get too crazy, Tim, uh, in the use cases here, I did want to say we don't have one here, but Kevin, I, he's got ours up there in Canada. You make a really really great point about Canada doing some fantastic work, and I I just wanted to maybe have Kevin just talk a minute about the the stuff that we've been like tossing spot into up there then then I'll let I'll turn it back over to you Tim I apologize <laughs> perfect oh where's Kev don't have your audio Kev 
Uh, am I missing his audio? Did he mute himself? I don't know. I'm all live. It's a... Scott, yeah. No, there, we're all good. We go. That was on me. So uh, essentially, it's a great point, John. So, um, so Spot today is out in uh, in a mining application. So if I could go a little Doctor Evil on anybody, he's uh, he's around some red hot magma today, literally. <laughs> uh, so he'll be doing some inspections in there, uh, and then uh, tomorrow he will be going uh, he will be going underground again, uh, and then he's going to be coming back and he's going to be doing some patrols around a uh, a large. Uh, uh, demolition site with uh, lots of metal recycling so for safety and security purposes so that's exciting uh, and then of course um, we have some of the premier, premier sort of preeminent adopters of this technology New Brunswick Power was one of the first out east and then uh, Ontario Power Generation is uh, is deploying these all over the place with some incredibly uh, exciting applications and really switched on uh, on people and so um, you know, certainly, certainly a shout out to some of the other uh, hydro companies in Canada who are all looking at this technology as well. So we'll have many more cases there. But this product is out there. It's being deployed in the field. People are asking about use cases every day. And we're working, uh, we're working very busily. If I can create a word, uh, John, I don't want you to have a monopoly on that. We're working very busily uh, on uh, finding applications for it. And so that's what um, what I'll kick it back to Tim to talk about is like how do you how do you go about this? So for those of you that joined yesterday for the Watts uh, the Watts thing and Bobby talked about it as a platform, Spot is absolutely a platform. We can put lots of great stuff on it, and we have. But how do you go about uh, deploying and introducing Spot in your organization, and what should you expect in terms of deployment? So. That's what we'll cover today based on these real real use cases from both Boston Dynamics and RMUS. So uh, so now we'll kick it over to you, Tim, and uh, and we should be rolling from here. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so we've we've been selling spot to the public for, for just under a year and, and we've uh, as Kevin mentioned, been working closely with the RMUS team as one of our first partners for, for about eight to nine months. Um, we're closing in on selling 500 robots um, and having 500 robots out in the wild globally. And, and we're seeing a, a variety of use cases. Kevin highlighted a number of them that, that have certainly been interesting, whether it's OPG or some of these mining use cases or, or a security use case at a manufacturer. Um, you know, the common denominator of, of all these use cases listed here is that spot um, companies are leveraging spot to collect data within a plant or maybe within an environment. You know, at the end of the day, data, data is the real critical piece that allows humans to understand how to make their operations run more efficiently. With, with these use cases, we tend to see two different themes of data collection or, or really modes of operation for how they're using spot. There's manual operating spot where, where someone is manually controlling it. And they're doing this oftentimes to perform a remote inspection, mostly in a dangerous environment. So the radiation detection may be, may be something. Um, how police departments are using spot to inspect a suspic suspicious package is, is another example. The other theme or the other thread is people that want to deploy spot on autonomous rounds and readings where spot is fully, fully autonomous and it's automating a mundane or a repetitive inspection in a plant. You know, regardless of what use case companies are going with or what mode of operation, we've really seen that our most successful clients have followed a consistent approach when it comes to deploying these robots in their operation. So the goal today is, is to help guide you through that process, explain that process to you, and, and enable you to be ready to, to deploy robots um, like Spot on your site. So the process to deploying robots in your environment really starts with an ROI workshop to understand what data is valuable to your business. Next, a series of iterative POCs helps you test the robot on real site and with real payloads, and you start stacking up quick wins towards achieving a real end-to-end -end solution that's gonna give you business results. From there, you start building out that actual end-to-end -end solution. You do that through a pilot deployment so that your business can start to measure the value of the ROI 
and and then scale to an actual implementation. The ROI workshop is, is really intended to answer a simple question. What's valuable to you on your site? Here is, is a time when you can bring a cross-functional team together to conduct them some design thinking and start to map out what is the direct and indirect ROI. When it comes to direct ROI, this, this is pretty straightforward and, and fairly easy to calculate ahead of time. It's basically, if Spot is able to do this on my site, we'll see these results. Could be improved safety, getting operators out of harm's way. It could be reducing travel to site or even not having operators travel to site. We've seen the importance of this really pick up over the last year with, with COVID and everything. And we, we think it's gonna continue where not having operators on the site is, is gonna uh, provide tremendous value. Another direct ROI could be just time savings. You know, having a robot collect data so a maintenance team can focus on more critical tasks like repairing equipment or, or doing something with that data that's been collected. Indirect ROIs can be a little bit more difficult to calculate up front, but often it's, it's really the larger scope of a return on investment. Some assumptions oftentimes have to be made here, but it's these areas that are going to provide businesses with a real competitive advantage um, of deploying robots on their site. If you start to think about it in uh, kind of what could you do if you had unlimited site data, um, that's really what these indirect ROI things uh, boil down to. You know, it's all the buzz around uh, automation and robotics right now, industry 4.0, industrial IoT, big data, you know, all of this gives you meaningful competitive advantages. So what would you do with that data? You could maybe detect errors or issues earlier, um, saving on costly re rework and preventing downtime. Um, you may be able to increase employee satisfaction. So if you have remote access to the site and you're aware of what's going on with machinery, you don't have to make unnecessary trips into site. Um, oftentimes you can better leverage your team. I mentioned maintenance people having to go out and inspect data. What if they didn't spend their Friday um, inspecting data and they were just out fixing equipment? This is really where they can make a, a larger impact on the business. And then all of this data has the potential to automate your workflows. So not only a maintenance person is saving on, on going out to perform inspections, but what if Spot automatically generated work tickets so that a worker just knew that after a Spot inspection that, hey, I have something that I have to do to prevent an issue on this specific asset or this piece of equipment. So to summarize, the ROI workshop is in place to help you understand the problem. It gives everyone a perspective on what the exact problem is um, and how safer data collection is solving it and, and then the business value that can come from it. We recommend that you take a design thinking approach, get a cross-functional team together, and write down your value hypothesis. And this allows you to then test those hypotheses as we get later into the process. Most importantly, use these sessions to get executive buy-in. Some of the indirect ROI that can be unlocked is a game changer at take, giving you a competitive advantage in your business. It's important to get executive buy-in so that you can unlock the right resources to really make this deployment successful. What are these resources? It really starts with a dedicated team that has the right skill sets to lead the proof of concept and the, the steps that we're gonna discuss here today. Um, next, a budget is required to acquire the hardware, to build a prototype, or to leverage some of the off-the-shelf integrations that Spot Ecosystems provides. You'll need access to the site. So if, if you're an innovation team, you'll need access to that site. You'll need access to operations teams so that you can actually test the robot in the field with real operators, with real users. Operator feedback is essential in this early phase, and it really provides allows you to get the best results. Um, you'll also want to set deadlines. You know, these help you drive the project for, forward, ensure that you have the right resources, the right funding available when they're most needed. Lastly, use this to get visibility within an organization. 
Many of us work in silos. You know, you don't have visibility into the other parts of the organization. This workshop and executive buy-in can help break down those walls and increase the company visibility. This oftentimes provides new opportunities where someone thinks of an idea, oh, maybe I can leverage Spot's data collection capabilities in this part of the plant or this part of the business. We've seen that with OBG and, and with several other customers. To provide an example of, of someone that did a good ROI workshop, I'd like to talk a little bit about Swinerton. Swinerton is a construction company that's located on the West Coast. They reached out to us last year to evaluate automating laser scanning with Spot. If you're not familiar, laser scanning is a super tedious task. It involves taking hundreds or even thousands of laser scans. Each of those can take five minutes where a person is just standing there waiting for that scan to be captured. This data collection process is expensive. Ford Motor Company, another Spot user, um, mentioned to us that it cost them over 300,000 to scan a single manufacturing plant. Once you've collected that data and scanned that site, the next step is stitching the data together into a global point cloud that represents the site. And that's what you see on the, the top right there. The cost and time involved in this process is so high that most general contractors like Swinerton, they'll only perform this process two to three times per new construction build. And existing plants, um, whether it's industrial plants, nuclear plants, they're often only scanning a site every eight to 10 years. So you really don't have true information of, of what your site looks like. With Spot, Winterton wanted to change this. They wanted to scan their, their build once a week. This would allow them to better leverage tools that they already had and start to perform automated analysis with tools like Avir. As Swinerton started this whole initiative, they conducted their, their ROI workshop. The direct ROI was easy. With aggressive, this aggressive goal of scanning weekly, they could save a ton of time on scanning. I had one customer, not Swinerton, but another customer recently tell me that they plan to manually scan uh, once a week, and they had a budget in the millions, close to tens of millions of dollars to uh, just the scanning task. So in addition to this time and cost saving, Spot also knows exactly where it is on site when it takes a scan. So feeding that data, it feeds that data into the sensor, and then um, this allows them to save on post-processing time. Some of the indirect ROI is really where, where the money starts to get more interesting. They started to think about what can we do if we have this data and how can we start to use it to automate progress tracking. Instead of having a PM or a project manager spend their time on site to manually measure process, progress, uh, to do things like approving payments to subcontractors, this could now all be done automatically. This allowed them to pay subs a lot faster. Um, rather than you know, paying a sub in 90 days after the work was completed, they paid them more quickly. What that did is improve those subs' ca cash flow situation, and it allowed them to lower their bids, um, in the end, saving Swinerton money. An unexpected benefit that they realized was better visibility to the actual business owner or the building owner. You know, by using Spot, they gave clear visibility into the progress to the owner, and that allowed them to create a better relationship and really position them to win more business from that owner uh, in the future. And, you know, having those types of sales impacts can be extremely impactful to, to a business like that. So that's a little bit about the ROI workshop and, and an essential kind of base to, to, and foundation to lay down. The next step in the deployment is to do iterative POCs or proof of concepts. This is an opportunity to take small steps to test the viability of the application. As opposed to trying to build everything at once, this is a faster way to quickly learn, quickly make adjustments and react. So you're not spending time planning. Um, you can probably do more in 30 minutes on site than days in planning meetings or days in a lab space. So this is this we've seen is really effective. It's a great opportunity to get feedback from people on site. Um, there's some innovation teams and, and OPG is kind of one of them where once they got spot on site, the minute they took it out, 
They had operators. They had dozens of I- new ideas of, hey, Spot could be valuable doing this or Spot could be valuable doing that. And so that that immediate attention on the shop floor um, allows employees to start to understand the purpose and the use case ideas really start to flow. By working in this iterative fashion, you can show and celebrate quick wins. And this allows you to make good progress towards an end-to-end solution and keep the executive buy-in strong. So the, the POC really breaks down into four key areas, and I'll let, uh, let Kevin dive a little bit more deeply into that. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. That was a great summary of the ROI process. And I think it's important to understand how important quick wins are with this, uh, with this product. And the nice part is you do get a ton of attention. It is a cool product. Uh, people do come up with ideas. So if you're an innovation team, uh, you get lots of visibility internally, lots of opportunities for testing. And then if you're an operations team, you get lots of buy-in and support with people wanting to be operators. And that's certainly been our experience. So uh, before we pass it back to Tim, I want to talk a little bit about what what is this what is this iterative POC process? What does it mean? What what does RMUS do? And so I think for those of you that have seen us talk before about how we do business, uh, particularly with Spot, is um, you'll know about my pet peeve, which is all these photos of LinkedIn of Spot in somebody's lobby with smiling executive guys in their suits. Um, well, I think that's a bunch of BS. I mean, it's nice for photo ops, but the important thing for us is we have a super dirty spot and we want to get it out there with you getting it dirtier, right? So the whole part of this process really is five steps. And we start that with you uh, from step number one, which is is mobility, really. Figuring out where spot can go because that'll enable everything that follows it. Can it actually get there? Once we determine where it could go, and there are two ways we go about that. One is if we happen to be on site, we'll do a couple of walks around uh, or we'll plan a more in-depth uh, proof of concept with you that will be uh, that will be a paid and much more detailed service. So once we get them walking around, the next step is then going to be how do we automate those missions? So does it need to be done on its own? Do we need multiple missions? Step number three then will be the sensor integration. And so we've already integrated a number of different sensors that Tim will talk about, gas detection, IR, acoustic, all kinds of things. So those will be really finding out what kind of data uh, can we can we then um, collect. The final one then will be, or the fourth one will be automating the the data collection. So now we're taking the sensors and all the autonomy we've done and built that into a continuous loop that has minimal to no uh, human interaction. And then the final stage is sort of theoretical, but that's the AI and and all the crazy future stuff. So um, so with that, I um, I will uh, let's go to the video, Jason, talk about mobility in a little bit more detail. So what we're going to be seeing here is uh, is going to be an example. This is uh, up in uh, scenic Sudbury um, at one of the mines there. So this is this is exactly what happens. So you're going to see you're going to see a dirty spot. He's got a he's got a piece together shield on that. That's that's a lidar sensor, the hover map. He's going through water. He's going over rocks, and this is just determining where where can we physically get him. Do we have some weird staircases? Do we have uh, do we have crazy angles? Um, do we have rocks? So all of, all of that is what we want to determine in the mobility. Same thing if you're in a construction site or something that's a little cleaner than this. Um, is there enough room to get him around between pillars? And that's that's really the first thing that we that we do. And from there, everything builds on uh, on that. So yeah, and once back, once you have that mobility tech, go ahead, Tim. We'll pass it back to me, right, Kevin? <laughs> um, so once you have that mobility test out of the way, you uh, you start to look at what is your mode of operation going to be. You know, how is Spot going to get around the site? You know, as mentioned earlier, there's two major themes here: uh, the remote inspection or the teleoperation. 
This is primarily focused around safety or, or really leveraging the robots to assist with dangerous tasks. Um, it could be organizations like uh, Ontario Power Generation who are using SPOT in a nuclear facility to perform inspection and reduce the dose exposure to their employees. Or it could be a, you know, a local police force that's using SPOT to reduce risk by inspecting suspicious packages or maybe sensing threats, chemical threats, biological threats in a hazmat response. In both of these examples, organizations would rather have their employees teleopping spot from a safe distance to do these inspections than exposing them to a dangerous, electrified, radioactive or, or explosive environment. So that's kind of the first thing is, is remote inspection. The second is, is back to spot being used for these autonomous rounds and readings. You know, many organizations are striving to start doing preventive or even predictive type maintenance. And, it, and to do that in order to increase uptime or, or prevent un, unplanned downtime. In order to do this, you must have a, a really clear pulse on what's going on with your machinery, what's going on with your assets, and, and this is where SPOT comes in. You know, maintenance teams are oftentimes too stretched. Um, they, they don't have enough time to perform these inspections on a frequent enough basis. And, and that's really what's required um, in order to start doing this, this preventive maintenance type, uh, type applications. Um, so Jace, you can play the, uh, the second video here. Perfect. Um, you know, really one of the most critical things, and this, this is showing our teleoperation software scout, but one of the most critical things here is ensuring that you have good communications. So as part of this test, you'll want to identify the right comm strategy. You know, the rest of it is really straightforward. We've, we've designed scout to be easy to use, um, whether it's from the tablet or this, this, uh, this web-based software, you know, you are able to, point and click on on spot to tell it where to go or point and click to tell it where you want its uh, pan tilt zoom to go and this makes it really easy for an operator to use um, you know another advantage of this platform is not only can these two people be looking at that stream you can have uh, people looking at this stream from anywhere so you get a good perspective on um, on you know what what information you're seeing and, and it allows people to work more closely together to make critical de decisions regardless of where they may be um, with autonomous missions the the process is a little bit different you'll want to ensure that spot can navigate your site autonomously and that you have the right payload configurations to be able to uh, to drive around your site. Sometimes an additional LiDAR sensor may be required in areas with less features or, or with uh, more open spaces. Really the key to these autonomy tests is running several missions, testing that repeatability, and ensuring that the data that you collect is, is accurate and is, is really what you're looking for. Um, you know, it's also important to identify hazards when, when you're designing these autonomous missions. You start to think about, hey, what could, what could block Spot's path? You don't want to necessarily make a route where, where Spot is, you know, going through a common staging area where there's going to be a lot of stuff or going through a high traffic area. This would reduce Spot's efficiency, you know, pr potentially create less accuracy in the data capture. So, um, so that's really important as well. Comms, although important, they're less important than the teleoperation. You know, Spot does have the ability to execute these missions and process data on the edge, but a network connection is, is needed um, you know, at some point in the process to, to upload that data to a cloud or to some uh, common area. So it's good to have some sort of comms strategy also in place. Kevin, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you to, to talk a little bit about how users going, go about setting up these autonomous missions. Thanks, Tim. Jace, do you want to go ahead and play this, uh, play this uh, video? So this is a great example. This is, this is an auto walk function uh, utilizing what we call fiducials, which are kind of like barcodes that are going to and then also um, enable it to perform certain functions at certain areas. So this is um, 
this is how you get uh, consistently repeatable missions. So, um, so that's the way this is in situations where you're not going to operate it remotely, uh, but you do not want to have it operator driven. And so that's the, uh, that's the second option there. So this is part of the POC process. Once you're convinced of where, uh, where it can actually go in terms of the terrain. So again, as Tim said, I do want to highlight the comms. So spot itself, is uh, on a Wi-Fi network and with the controller, it has enough range that you can test a lot of these features. But for some of these autonomous missions, you are gonna need some additional communications. So we, we as part of our POCs, we, we will do them where we work to get it on your uh, local network or we work with the radiant mesh radio systems to extend the range. So if you're looking for something that's gonna be several hundred meters in length, around multiple bends, we're going to need to build the comms into it, uh, unless you want to use the controller to manually walk spot. So important to uh, important to understand there. We do have these deployed right now. One of the biggest asks um, in, in, uh, in the marketplace is for some of this remote uh, inspection and remote monitoring of anything that's rural or uh, outstationed from a main, um, from a main plant. And so the plan with these is to look at having ready on its dock and to be able to be either activated to do auto walk missions inside, say, a substation or a warehouse or outside in some cases. Um, and then in some cases through the scout system actually teleoperated remotely. So that's, that's a use case that's happened in multiple, multiple scenarios. Uh, and then um, also looking at being able to automate security parameters or parameters. So, um, so those are two things that are happening right now. Uh, and that has mostly been over the networks, but Spot does have the capabilities and we'll be doing more tests for LTE deployments as well. So if you're not in the access of a network, but you do have cell coverage at your remote location, you'll be able to operate uh, that way. And again, that's physical operation as well as uh, auto walk uh, autonomy. So, um, so that's the second part. So, Tim, let's uh, let's throw it back to you to talk about the third part, which is now that we know where we can get and what we can do when we get there. What data do we want to collect? And this is something we really specialize in: is integrating the standard ones and things that whatever you're interested in. And there's a great UI um, and a great API for BD to do that. So, Tim, back to you to talk sensors. Great. Yeah, exactly right. After you know the mobility set, you know the comm strategy, sens sensors is really next the next step. So this image here on the right, you know, exactly one of those remote areas that, that Kevin mentioned where you want to wake spot up uh, off its dock in a substation to to create uh, or start doing some sort of inspection. So this, this image shows our spot cam plus IR payload. Um, a thermal payload, which I'll, I'll talk about here a little bit later. But you know, this sensor is fully integrated to spot. It allows users to capture 360 degree photos. It allows them to pan, tilt, perform up to a 30x optical zoom, and then also capture those those thermal images. And this is a, the use case. This is National Grid's robot um, at, a, at a substation inspection. And the thermal piece was was exactly what, what they were trying to do in, in this photo. So, you know, what are you doing during this sensor, sensor POC? D the data that you're collecting is really typically going to be the most important part of the ROI. So this sensing POC is, is also equally important. Um, and it's, it's pretty basic. Can you collect the data that's required to unlock that ROI? You know, do you have the right field of view? Does it have the right repeatability? Um, are you are you saving the right metadata or do you have the right metadata available so that you can provide enough insight um, after the fact to, to what data was captured and, and what you do with that data? So out of the box, Spot doesn't come with, with any sensor payloads. Um, at, at the top, Kevin mentioned that uh, yesterday there was another platform that was reviewed. You know, Spot is very much a platform. We've designed it specifically so that it is a, a highly dynamic, very agile uh, mobility platform that can go anywhere humans tend to go. But we've also designed it so that it can be highly customizable. 
Um, early on, we, we heard a lot of different use cases. And so we knew that we had to enable um, anyone to add any type of payload and really allow SPA to be sensor agnostic. So you can integrate different payloads through our Python-based API. The only limitation or one of the only limitations is really weight. So SPOT has a, a payload capacity of uh, 30 pounds, um, about 14 kilograms for, for the Canadians on the call. Um, and as you, as you can see in this image, our clients have stacked a variety of different payloads. They've also wrapped a spot in a variety of different colors or designs to fit their specific application. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those payloads uh, here. Um, so the SpotCam IR, this is a Boston Dynamics payload. Um, I mentioned it before, has has PTZ, uh, pan tilt zoom, has a thermal sensing capability, also has a high sensitivity mic. Um, you can stream this video directly to the tablet if you're using it in a teleoperation, or you can perform actions throughout an auto walk mission in order to capture specific data. Um, in this image here, you're seeing a spot, a, a gauge that was captured um, and and we'll talk a little bit about using AI to do gauge reading uh, later on in the um, in the conversation. But you know, really throughout this sensing POC, this step is: Are you accurately and repeatedly picking up this image that's going to be critical to to unlocking the ROI? So we have a variety of in-house payloads and, and RMUS can do a, really help you understand which one will be the right fit for your application. But we've also partnered with third-party companies to, to develop and integrate popular payloads. Trimble is, is one example of those. They offer a, a 3D LiDAR scanner uh, for creating digital twins. They also have an integrated GNSS antenna for GPS um, so that you're able to operate spot based on GPS coordinates and get centimeter level accuracy. We've also partnered with FLIR. They have a, an eight channel gas detector that we've integrated. Um, and, and we also, with the FLIR payload, we, de we designed a, an in-house integration where the robot can actually be, um, motor power can be shut down on the robot if it senses that it has 10% LEL level of, of gas. So in some of the oil and gas and that chemical applications, that's a solution that people are using um, along with a hot work permit to deploy. We've been working really closely with the RMUS team um, and, and directly with Emerson on integrating the hover map LiDAR sensor. So this is something that's common with a lot of the mining customers um, and, and is starting to go into other industries as well. Um, you know, all of these integrations, they provide the user with a plug and play experience. So basically, all they have to do is get the mounting hardware, get the integration code from um, one of these partners, and then the sensors just work. They work with the tablet interface, the sensors can be triggered via the tablet, or they work with the autonomous missions where a user can create an action to trigger the, the sensor to, uh, to take a reading. Um, these, these are really just the start. We'll have a, a number of other exciting third-party payloads that are, that are in the works and will be coming out later this summer. Um, and it will really expand on the tools and the capabilities that, that uh, Spot will have. Um, so the next step in the process is, is really uh, the application POC. And this, this comes down to getting the robot on site and making sure operators can use it. You want operators to, to see, hey, what are the barriers that would prevent them from, from making this easy to use? Um, you know, ask the customers or ask the operators, what would improve this concept? What could we do to make this better? And really start to find out, is this, is this ready to be piloted? BP is a really good example of a, you know, of a customer or a client that went through this, this process. We've been working with BP for quite some time uh, to deploy spot to some of their oil and gas sites. You know, they've gone through the structured methodology to really iteratively test spots capabilities. And, and it's proven to be very successful. Um, you know, so first, 
some of the first things that they did is, is they said, hey, we want we want to send spot out onto an oil and gas site, but it's risky. You know, we want to make sure that it's going to work when it gets out there. So kind of walking through this step by step process, they, they first identified um, some mobility challenges. They said, hey, we have graded platforms. We have open riser stairs. We think these are two key mobility challenges that we want to understand spot can can navigate on. So we went down to a mock site at, at a place called Teeks in Texas, and we tested Spot in this environment and made sure that it could perform on these surfaces. Next, they were concerned about Spot's ability to navigate more open sites, you know, not necessarily an offshore rig, maybe a refinery where there's a lot more space between assets and between features. In this test, we determined that Spot's base stereo camera and its two meter range was not quite good enough to, to autonomously navigate. So we uh, added the, the EAP or our enhanced autonomy payload, which is a LIDAR payload, and, and knew that this would need to be a, a part of any future deployment um, at a refinery site, just so we could increase the autonomy radius. Then they, they went on and started adding sensors. They added a gas sensor uh, to do that, that shutdown. They added one of our standard camera payloads, the, the Spot Cam Plus, uh, Plus PTZ. And they added a mesh radio, you know, a, a comm solution, as Kevin mentioned, that would allow them to, uh, to have reliable comms when they got off site. Um, and, and they did all this to really start to say, hey, what is the end-to-end -end solution going to be? And the end-to-end -end solution that they were after was visual inspection. So they wanted Spot to go around, do an autonomous mission, do a rounds and readings type scenario, and just collect visual data. And that's what they were uh, interested in. So after they, they developed kind of all these integrations, put this spot together. They took spot out to Mad Dog, which is a, a rig in the Gulf of Mexico to deploy it on a rail site. Um, and there they got a lot of good operator feedback. How would you improve that? How would you, uh, how would you move that forward? And, and uh, they had great results. So that's, that's really exciting to see someone take it from step one to the full solution. Now, when you, when you start thinking about the end-to-end -end solution, um, that's really where BP is at, is, okay, we, we have these inspections done. We're getting all this really great data. Now, how do we start to analyze um, that data automatically? So adding computer vision, adding AI. Um, starting to think about where does that data go? Does it go to a visualization system somewhere? Does it go to uh, a, um, an asset management system like IBM Maximo or SAP? You know, where is that data going? And I'll, I'll pass it over to, uh, to Kevin to talk through this a little bit more and give an example of someone that's, that's building out this end-to-end -end solution. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tim. So I think, this is, this is particularly exciting. And so there are certainly um, uh, users here in Canada that are looking now at utilizing things like uh, private Microsoft Azure Cloud, uh, integrating other things like the Microsoft HoloLens to really look at collecting and, and analyzing this data. Um, we have an exciting new partnership with Ontario uh, Tech University, just Ontario Tech. Uh, and, uh, and a private organization here that will be developing specific UI for display of their variety of data feeds in this, uh, in this particular way. Um, so that's something that's going to be very exciting. And then part of that will also be integrating some of these new sensors into that data feed. So um, in addition to what Tim said, uh, specific gas detection has been talked about and has been done, uh, acoustics, uh, and also uh, sound recording. So. Um, so those are things that are exciting and, and happening uh, happening right now. So um, so are we going to show the uh, the BP video? Oh, okay. Just pa pause that there for a sec, Jace. Sorry, I thought we had a BP BP video too. So um, it's okay. So let's go let's go right ahead to step number five. So um, what step number five is 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 starting to happen uh, and I think is the direction that things will go eventually um, uh, if not if not sooner and that is really the integration of 
multiple platforms into the data collection. So aerial and ground platforms. So all of a sudden combining spot with some of our traditional drones and UAVs to look at different angles, look at being able to generate different densities of point clouds, able to get to different areas that you can't get on ground or air. So that's going to be one really, really important part. And that's kind of step five is integrating multiple data feeds and also building out advanced AI applications. So Jason, you wanna go in ahead and show the Percepto video now. Um, so this is some, some kind of breaking news. So Percepto is an Israeli company that specializes in uh, autonomous drone in a box solutions. They are also now a Boston Dynamics partner. So we are their first partner here in Canada, uh, and we will be deploying aerial and ground-based autonomous systems uh, in conjunction. There's already discussions we expect to have on the ground pilots happening later this year. Um, but this is exciting because now we are going to physically be able to cover larger areas. We're going to be able to do inside and outside of structures uh, in a combined way. And then as part of this, as part of this partnership with Ontario Tech, uh, we're also going to be developing uh, with them specific AI for being able to do things like uh, tracking of, sub of subjects for security. Uh, and then also uh, specific applications for uh, for triggering actions internally. So a lot of this uh, will be will be done autonomously um, and uh, and with data streaming into a central location on on customized. So so that's just to give you an idea of what is technologically possible already uh, and will be deployed soon. And of course, the AI and machine learning aspects are only going to be getting better. So it allows you to, to dream a little bit on the future. So uh, Tim, did you want to add anything before we open it up to Q&A or John? Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing, you know, once once that end-to-end -end solution is is uh, is developed, really the next step is, is learning how to deploy this across multiple sites. And, I, you know, I think this process can then be used to say, hey, this was our ROI hypothesis. These were the end results based on the pilot uh, implementation and the end-to-end -end solution. And, and then having that data um, will allow you to, to, again, go back to that executive buy-in and say, these were our results, now let's scale this fleet. Um, you know, we, we've seen customers uh, with RMUS, like OPG, already start to do that. They saw immediate ROI, immediate success based off running spot through this type of iterative process, and then are quickly saying, all right, what do we do next? Where do we take the next spot? And, and how does the next spot help our business? So um, hopefully this was helpful in, in saying, hey, where do I get started? You know, when I get a spot, what do I do? Uh, hopefully this this helps answer some of those questions and, and yeah, happy to answer any questions that uh, may remain. Well, to say I'm thoroughly impressed is, uh, you know, an understatement when it comes down to uh, what you can do with a spot. Um, you know, uh, of course, uh, you know, Tim says, you know, where do you start? Well, I'm pretty sure, my, you know, Kevin and I, when we first got him, we just, we'd drive him around, thought, man, this thing is just cool as heck. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the way it moves, how it decides to, to look at its space, how, how you know, and then you, you just get more into it and more into it of like, what else can we do with this thing? But let's, let's get into Q&A real quick. Let's, let's address some of the questions that have come up. Um, let's see, so, so I've got Rajiv who, who, Rajiv here, who basically, on the, it's a LiDAR question, and I get, the, I get the answer here, but I'm gonna go ahead and just talk about it real quick. So he says, when is a LiDAR typically used for the payload? And then in a second question, instead of the standard uh, uh, Velodyne uh, 16, why not use a 32? And and from what I understand, Tim, you explained that the Velodyne puck that sits on the back of Spot is more for integration to seeing its world farther than the internal sensors that are that are not equipped. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So the the way we use that Velodyne puck is um, is to increase the autonomy space so so what spot can see um we're actually we're actually 
really stripping down the 16 so we're not even using all the point cloud that that, that gives us. So there, there'd be no purpose to going to the 32 because really all we care about is, hey, let's create a map of this environment and then let's localize this environment. So it's not actually uh, being used to generate data-rich uh, point clouds maybe for the purposes of creating a digital twin. So, you know, some of the other payloads, uh, whether it's the um, the hover map, you know, the Trimble solutions, the Faro solutions, the Leica solutions, you know, all of those can then be used to uh, to really give a data rich point cloud. Okay. So uh, hopefully that answers your questions, Rajiv, because because as well, you know, that, you know that first image you see that that lidar puck on the back, and 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 being very clear that it is only for navigation. It's not being used for the for the data collection. Adding a second sensor on there. That is specialized to do data collection is what is what we're looking at here. So, so just to be a little bit more clear on that. All right, on to the next question. Um, so, uh, is, is Spot classified to work in safe environments, or, or, or is is it able to work in classified environments? So, so we already know putting it down underground can be kind of dicey as far as trying to move around in spaces. But I think, you know, when we're putting it in nuclear plants, when we have gas and, and all kinds of things, are we basically running this as a intrinsically safe? And, and it is a common question we get often, Tim, in the uh, drone space of putting things into very, you know, sensitive areas that could be not intrinsically safe. So get, maybe you can t speak a little bit about, about that possibility or what you guys have done to kind of mitigate, you know, this issue if there is one. Yeah, of course. So in in nuclear environments, you know, we, we don't see too many applications where we need it to be, um, you know, have specific intrinsic safety. Um, it, it's not rad hardened, but it can go into those environments. We've seen spot exposed to, you know, a lot of dose, a lot of radiation and, and survive you know just fine so we have we have several users that are kind of testing the limits of, of how much radiation spot can can really uh withstand and we hope to have more data um that we're doing or, or we're testing with in the near future of hey what are the upper limits of, of radiation that it can take um on the intrinsic safety side of things you know think about oil and gas sites or petrochemical sites some of the strategies that our customers have done, such as Woodside or BP um, or, or Shell or others, have been to to take out hot work permits for spots. So they, you know, just as you would when you're welding, when you're performing some sort of work on site, or even when you're carrying a cell phone or a tablet around your site, you know, a person will get a hot work permit. And so our users are, are taking out a hot work permit for spot and, and designing a risk mitigation plan around that. You know, one of those plans would be to, to leverage the gas sensor and uh, that I talked about, the FLIR C360. And you can use that to detect 10% uh, LEL. And then once you sense that, you can actually shut down motor power. And, and that's a risk mitigation plan that companies like BP have, have leveraged. Mm. Excellent. You know, and, and like I said, it, I can imagine there's a lot of environments that people want to put spot into just because it's so much safer. But we have to consider those those environmental conditions as well, you know, being, you know, very bad even for spot. So um, excellent. Uh, let's move on to the next question. So um, I've got two of them here, but I'm going to hold them here for just a second. Um, but do you do you recommend the autonomous uh, Alessandro asks, you know, do you recommend the autonomous configuration of spot? What do you recommend in which use cases? So if you gave me three use cases here, Tim or Kevin, of what the autonomy side of things could be really well used for, like just what are three things that that you could do the autonomy side so much as doing the manual driving? Yeah, I, I can give a couple. I know, you know, I know some of Kevin's customers are exploring 
um, inspection at, at solar fields. So, you know, going through a, a solar field and doing inspections, uh, oftentimes drones are used to kind of see from the air, but you know, what if you need to see stuff underneath those panels? So uh, we have we have a lot of people that are using autonomy to, to inspect those types of situations. Um, and the others are, are really just the rounds and the readings, you know, doing things like gauge reading or taking thermal images of something to, to, to try and detect a thermal anomaly or maybe taking an acoustic image or an acoustic reading of something to detect an acoustical anomaly. And, and really those, you know, those use cases all tend to solve um, or do kind of predictive or preventative maintenance type applications and, and really boil down to letting a maintenance person do their job as a as ex as opposed to having them uh, you know spend half a day just doing inspections. They can actually spend their time fixing stuff and making a real impact on on improving outcome. Mm. Yeah, that I wouldn't I wouldn't think of uh, an automated inspection like that to be you know done in the solar field, but that totally makes sense. A large space, a large area, you know, being able to do that. So um, perfect example of that. Uh, let's go to our three view one more time there, Jace, and then uh, let's see. I've got a couple more here um, from, I don't want to butcher this, Isam. I think that's Isam. Is there some industrial applications for SPOT? Are, the, are, uh, are they in contact with standard robotics manufacturers? I'm, I'm trying to kind of make sense of that one. Are, are they in contact with some standard robots manufacturer? So I think I think we've outlined pretty much for everybody. There's a ton of industrial applications here. I mean, I I don't know if there's anything that you can't put spot into at this moment in time that, or at least trying to figure out, you know, whether or not uh, you can do something with them. I mean, there's there's a lot of people testing that. So I kind of understand the question, but we'll we'll move on to the next one. Also uh, from Alessandro. Uh, when you talk about integrations, what is the protocol to control the spot? Is there a specific protocol? I know we've talked about many different ways to actually have spot do stuff, but maybe just a recap on uh, Kevin, you know, the communication protocols. What, what are we doing? Like we're manually doing it. We've got Wi-Fi. You know, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure, I'll, I'll address a little bit, and then uh, and then we can we can pass over to Tim for some of the more detailed technical stuff. But yeah, the three the three uh, primary methods are are by uh, are by Wi-Fi, so by your network, and in those situations where you're on, say, a corporate network, uh, what will happen is you will give the controller and Spot uh, both static IP addresses on the network, and then you'll be able to control Spot with the controller. Uh, throughout the network. And again, you will physically have to do that with the controller. Um, so you'll be driving it or you can initiate one of those auto walks if it's pre-programmed. So that's one. The second way is by a mesh network. Again, we, we tend to use Ragent, which is just you're adding an additional uh, radio to your controller. You're adding an additional one on the robot itself. And then you have the ability to create uh, little breadcrumbs that are called little nodes that you'll lay out uh, uh, throughout the inside or outside, depending on what you're going to do that's going to uh, control a network. And then the third, and right now probably the least efficient, is uh, is via an LTE connection. I think you will start to see more development in those areas, um, but those are the three primarily ways to do it. So, Tim, do you, want, do you want to add anything more technical than that? No, I, I think you you nailed it there with, with the communications. Um, if you're asking more about how how you control spots movement, you know, the, the the main way to do that is is through a tablet. Um, Kevin's tablet is out in the mine, it sounds like today, but this is what the tablet looks like. And all a user is doing is pressing up, down, side to side on that joystick. Um, we talked a lot about industrial inspection today. But even with the spot arm, uh, we've, we've made it really easy for, for users to use. So they can, again, control the arm by manipulating those joysticks. And we also have uh, some human-guided autonomy with the arm. So for opening a door, for instance, all a user does is press the door handle on the, uh, on the tablet. And, and Spot will go through an algorithm to automatically open that door on its own. So we've tried to make it really easy to use. Um, 
if you're into the API and talking about how do you control it via, via the API, uh, you can give spot trajectory and velocity commands through the Python based API if, if you go. don't want to use our tablet interface. Yeah, that that was going to be my second question, Tim. So thank you for answering that. Is is basically what is the the programming protocol that you guys use to do you know this integration is is and so Python being uh, the main API side. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, we will be we will be rolling out a C plus plus version of the API um, here here in the short term. Okay, excellent. Alessandro, I hope that helps you out. And then um, uh, Madhu has a really good question here. Um, can a custom payload with dimensions equal to mounting the rail dimensions, length and width, put on spot, would that sacrifice any of the self-writing capabilities? And basically, you know, if we have something too big, you know, will it not allow him to self-write or, and I know we put a big, huge cage around our, our uh, hover map there, Kevin, just to protect it and not just falling down. But if it does, you still have to, it, you know, spot still needs to kind of, you know, get itself back up. Is there any, have you seen anything, Tim, on how people have been, been integrating the, 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 at least the hardware of that being an issue? If for some reason he falls down, what would the dimensions be? Would it, would it, you know what's too big i suppose <laughs> sure um and, and i don't have it off the top of my head but you know if if you follow those rails and you build your payload upon there um you should be pretty good um on our developer site which is dev dev dot boston dynamics dot com uh there is a page that talks about the payload integration and it gives you the exact bounding boxes. Um, you know, the key thing is making sure in the self writing behavior spot will kind of lift its leg almost above its body and just making sure that your payload is clear of that. And those, those bounding boxes on the depth site will, will help guide you to, uh, to ensure that. Okay. Is, is that available somewhere just to, you know, so, so this, this segues into the next question, you know, people want to purchase it. They want to buy it. Of course they want to try stuff, but there's always people that have issues of just putting out the dollars to, to get it initially, maybe kind of coming up with, with some engineering, you know, capability there. But, um, so somebody did ask, and we always get this in almost every presentation, Kevin, I don't even know how much they are. What, what is the baseline cost? Uh, what are the, what are the versions that we have out there? I know, I know we have two, but what are we looking at like cost on this thing? Yes, it's, it's, it's a great question. So obviously you have the, uh, the Explorer units, which, uh, which were the first kind of experimental units. And those are, uh, those are starting at around, uh, around the 75,000 US kind of 100,000 Canadian mark um, and that will get you going now if you want to use the advanced autonomy uh, and or uh, some of the docking features you'll need to go out to an Explorer version uh, and again that will be more advanced so you'll need to look at different comms things like that so pricing will vary um, realistically I would say you know from a budget perspective if you're wanting to do a, a full proof of concept um, you should be asking in, in the neighborhood of uh, sort of 200,000 US to 250 Canadian, and that will cover you for pretty much most of what you want to do to get started. Uh, and again, there's going to be variance in that depending on what sensors and how much integration work you can do. But, um, but if I was an innovation team or something, that would be my, uh, that would be my ask to get going. So um, now, also just on that one, talking about I innovation teams, and before... I made fun of, you know, executives walking around with a nice clean spot in their boardroom. Um, use that to your advantage because I'm going to tell you uh, that executives love spot. They love the publicity they get from spot. It's a, it's a big deal. So by all means, take spot up there and let them get all the photos they want uh, before you ask for your, uh, your check. And I guarantee your, you will increase your odds of getting your check exponentially. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I, you know, we had a little blip out there. We had some guys were operating some stuff up in Canada. Definitely went uh, viral. I remember that. <laughs> I think Kevin remembers that, you know, and it wasn't intended to be anything 
you know, terrible or bad. It was, you know, let's test the machine and see how it turns out. But as, as you mentioned, there wasn't very many out there. And of course, you know, the general public is like, holy crap, what is that? So, so, you know, it definitely commands, you know, there's no doubt that Boston Dynamics commands people to look at it, ask about it. You know, we've done presentations here locally at some of the local schools and, and brought spot out and the kids just get, ex I mean, they're, as soon as he starts moving around, people, you know, it's it pulls it. It it absolutely does. So so great job with your team there, Tim. Uh, we're pushing about five minutes over time. Um, I do have just two more questions or one more question, uh, and this alludes to the fact that you guys did a great presentation and did great knowledge. Tim, are the slides available for this show uh, that we had, or should we just recommend people rewatch the the actual thing? So so there's always you know. A lot of people when they do the great slide deck, you know, you guys had a lot of great information. It ties in with the uh, absolutely the way that you present it. So I would suggest people rewatch this webinar. We'll have it available. But do you have do you guys keep any of that stuff available uh, for people to look at later? Yeah. So so definitely rewatch this this webinar. And we also actually have a white paper. So reach out to Kevin. Reach out to the RMUS team. And, and we can actually get you a, a hard copy of, of a white paper that walks through kind of these these six steps or these five steps to uh, deploying Spot. And uh, and I just uh, one more question for you. And I don't know if you really have a quick, I have an answer for this one, but I'll just go ahead and, and ask it. You know, from Philippe, um, do you have any any issues? Is customers going to have any issues from the way? Uh, Boston Dynamics is kind of moving around in companies. First they were with SoftBank, now they're with Hyundai. You know, what does this open the door for you guys to now have this relationship with Hyundai? You know, kind of a little upper level thing, but I think it's, you know, a lot of people, you know, have a, have that question, you know, what does it look like? Because before Boston Dynamics was kind of their own thing, and then it was this, and then it was this, and now we're just, we're expanding. We're seeing these go everywhere. How, how does the business model kind of look, Tim? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and a fair question. So, you know, Boston Dynamics is at this pivot point, right, where we're going from being an R&D company for 25 years to, to being a, a commercial company that's actually um, mass manufacturing and, and putting robots out into the field. So in order to do that, it, it obviously takes investment. And as we started to look for our, our next investor, which which turned out to be Hyundai, you know, one of the critical things was making sure we found a partner that believed in in what we've done, believed in what we were doing, and and really backed our vision. And and that's the most exciting part about this this uh, new relationship with Hyundai is is that they they truly do. And so we're super excited about it. Um, you know, it opens up opportunities for us to. Uh, expand our production. You know, right now we're building about a thousand units per year. We'd love to. Uh, we'd love for our US to be selling a thousand units a year just just on their own. So, you know, we we hope to. This relationship will help us expand our production, expand our service team, um, and really help us grow as we mature as a uh, as a commercial organization. Perfect. You know, uh, great question, Philippe. I think that's a great way to kind of end the presentation today. I, I really do uh, value, of course, having this on Tech Week, having the relationship with Boston Dynamics, being one of the first guys ever to, you know, arm US as far as getting them getting a hold of us. I mean, we, we were very interested at one point or another of getting into this robotic side, but obviously it's proven some worth uh, in trying to get these, these, uh, uh, pieces of equipment out there. Uh, excited to see other developments, obviously, with with this relationship between a large company like this. So, so thank you again. Um, unless you guys had anything else you wanted to comment, uh, I think we're pretty much good for today's presentation. <laughs> I'll, I'll Thanks, take John. that as a goodbye <laughs> from Kevin. <laughs> no words. <laughs> Hey, I, by the way, I need that growler that you have. I'm just saying, you know, it's it's unfair. I've just got my silver coffee mug. You've got the nice Boston Dynamics mug. That's, you know, what the heck, man. Tim, I need you to work some magic for me, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get that over you, John. Don't worry. All right. Excellent. 
Well, if you guys didn't have anything else, I really value, again, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Kevin, for joining me today, uh, helping everybody kind of understand exactly what's out there in the industry, making some impact on their on their ROI, as well as uh, being safe out there. So safe flying, safe driving, do everything else. Don't forget to join me uh, just in a few hours at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, we're going to have Rock Robotics. So anybody that was asking about LiDAR questions, uh, at least driving around on spot, we've got some new stuff that will be out there today, understanding their Rock uh, software as well, how it works and what it does. So join me with Harrison Knoll. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit LiDAR geeky stuff and, and putting that together in just a few hours at 2 p.m. Additionally, tomorrow I have Skybrows, who will be joining us as well. Uh, to finish out Tech Week, Army OS Tech Week. And I think this has been a great you know, way to get the, the word out, kind of talk about, again, all of these great uh, representatives from each of these companies and, and not just trying to sell you something, but trying to make sure that you have a great idea on, on how to use the equipment and what to do pushing your company forward, creating, again, a level of ROI and safety. So join me in, a, in just a few hours, and I'll see you guys soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today.